Tim Parlatori, thank you for speaking with CBS News. What's your assessment of the Florida grand jury appearance of former Trump aide and spokesman Taylor Budowich? So I don't think that it really is too much consequence. Taylor's a guy who's you know, been around and they, he's been around the president and the other staff. And so they've been asking just about everybody you know, down to the maids. You know, Did you see anything? Have you ever seen any documents around? So uh, that kind of strikes me as more of a check the box kind of a witness. And you know, from what I hear, he wasn't in there for very long. Well, that's right. In a tweet, uh, Budowich called his grand jury testimony in Florida troubling and an effort to, quote, get Trump. Your thoughts? Well, uh, he is certainly part of the comms team, and I, I understand his feelings. I mean, it is a situation where they have called a whole bunch of people in before the grand jury that, in any ordinary case, you know, they wouldn't go to that length and expense of going all the way down to you know, maids, groundskeepers, and everybody else. So that's those those people have been in front of the grand jury or questioned by the FBI. Correct. Okay. Um, why a second grand jury in Florida for the special counsel? To me, that's an indication that this team screwed up. So they started this case with a grand jury in D.C., and yet everything uh, that we've heard about as far as what the allegations are, retention of documents happened in Florida. Any alleged uh, obstruction would have happened in Florida. And yet they did the grand jury in D.C. where there's really no nexus and no venue. So it wouldn't surprise me if they kind of got to the end and, you know, Smith kind of looked at it and said, wait a minute. We forgot this threshold issue. Now we have to go to Florida and start all over again. You left the Trump legal team in mid-May. Is this Florida grand jury a relatively new development? It's something that I was not aware of at the time. Uh, I heard, I learned about it after I left. Uh, well, we probably would have. Uh, you know, certainly when witnesses get called, uh, you know, we have found out about a lot of them. So we, you know, more so than any other case I've ever been involved in, we've been able to track, you know, what the DOJ was doing in this case. So I think that Florida is a pretty new development here. The Trump lawyers got their meeting at the Justice Department on Monday based on our reporting here at CBS News. The special counsel, Jack Smith, was in that meeting. Is a charging decision imminent in the classified documents case? I would think so, because that's the type of meeting that you would have before make, they make that kind of a decision. It's kind of like, you know, before they go forward and, you know, the, the round is down range and can't be recalled, it's good to have that meeting so that the defense can point out to the decision makers the things that the prosecution team may have missed, uh, things that, you know, other atmospherics that they should consider, whether there's, you know, misconduct on behalf of the prosecution team. Uh, and other legal arguments that they have met, may have missed so that DOJ doesn't run forward, get an indictment, and then suffer a quick setback from a, uh, from a dismissal. What does imminent mean to you? I imminent means it could be in the next, next few weeks, next month. Um, you know, I don't know exactly you know, what it is. You know, oftentimes when you have those meetings, DOJ wants to take all the information that the defense provides and they want to go back and verify it all. And, and do what they can to see, you know, did we make a mistake? Okay. Do the, did they, um, you know, present things that we should have considered? So it's not one of those things where, you know, you have the meeting and then two days later there's an indictment, ordinarily, if they take the meeting seriously. Uh, any insight into what the Trump attorneys uh, shared with uh, the special counsel and Justice Department officials on Monday? I don't know exactly uh, what they discussed. I know that, um, you know, the two categories that you would ordinarily discuss in that meeting and you know what I would have done is you would talk about the case itself and you know the facts and circumstances in the law um, to discuss you know is this the type of case that should be charged is this the kind of case that you can win a conviction on and are there appellate issues but then the other category are kind of all of the other atmospherics to it you know is there misconduct are there other things that um, that a prosecuting agency should consider when deciding whether to exercise discretion in a matter. The Trump attorneys have raised questions about prosecutorial misconduct in this case. What did you witness? I witnessed a lot of misconduct. What did that look like? So I, uh, it's been reported, I went before the grand jury myself. Um, I was not subpoenaed. I went in voluntarily mm -hmm. um, as, you know, in the place of a custodian of records. And I was really stunned by what I saw in the grand jury room by the conduct of the prosecutors. 
You know, they made many attempts to, uh, to try to get at privileged communications. They would ask me about conversations with my client. They would make improper references to the jury, trying to mislead them about that. At one point, it got to the level where, you know, they're asking me this again, and then they turn to the grand jury and they say, so you're refusing to provide this information. Like, no, I'm not refusing to provide. The ethical rules prohibit me. Even if the answer to this question is helpful, I'm not allowed to give it. And I turned to the jury and I said, and she knows it. She knows that it's an improper question. It's an improper inference. That then led to an exchange where she tried saying, well, the privilege has exceptions. It could be waived, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, if the president's so cooperative, why won't he waive privilege and allow you to tell the grand jury about his conversations? Why does that cross a legal red line? Well, that, that crosses a major red line as far as implying guilt to a jury based on the invocation of a constitutional right. It's the kind of thing that if that had happened in a trial court, the judge would have immediately you know, stopped everything, probably declared a mistrial. And it's the kind of thing that, quite frankly, an attorney, a prosecuting attorney who willfully does that type of thing, would potentially face discipline. And I think that they probably will when this case comes out. So just to be clear, when you left uh, former President Trump's legal team about two weeks ago, there was a plan in place if he were indicted. Oh, sure. Sure. Any, any attorney in that situation would want to have a good plan in place. And I have every faith in, in Jim Trusty and John Rowley and, and Lindsey Halligan to execute that. Absolutely. And, and when you left in mid-May, it was part of that plan to file motions to dismiss based on allegations of prosecutorial misconduct. Yeah, I, I don't want to get into the specifics of what the plans were, and I'm sure that those plans have evolved since. But, yeah, prosecutorial misconduct is a big issue that's infecting this case. Uh, Evan Corcoran testified yes. uh, in a limited nature before the grand jury here in Washington, mm -hmm. and the prosecutors have uh, his notes and apparently some voice memos as well. Are you familiar with these pieces of evidence? Yes. What can you tell us about them? I reviewed those notes. There is nothing that I read in there that really you know, shocked me as far as you know, all these claims of uh, crime fraud exception. You got to remember, that litigation was done before the prosecutors had access to the actual notes. It was all based on supposition of they want access to the notes to see if they will match their theory. And I think once they got the notes, they realized, wow, it doesn't match our theory at all. And so, you know, based on everything I've seen, if they don't change their theory of obstruction, if they keep with the same, you know, theory that they've been pursuing there throughout, uh, Evan Corcoran very well could be a witness in this case, but he'd be a witness for the defense. So to be clear, you've reviewed the Corcoran notes yes. and these voice memos? Uh, those are essentially one and the same. It's a transcript. You know, he, he took uh, voice memos okay. you know, rather than writing it out. And to be clear, your assessment is they are not damaging to the former president's case? Correct. On Correct. what basis? These are ordinary conversations that an attorney would have with their client who has just received a grand jury subpoena. You know, questions get asked. This happens, it's happened to me hundreds of times where a client gets a subpoena and they say, do we have to comply with this? Do we really have to give them everything? Do they have this power? Don't they have to get a judge to approve this? How do we, uh, you know, do we have an opportunity to, you know, to stop this? Can you file a motion? All of those questions of do we really need to respond to this uh, which, so you're described, yeah. just to be clear, you're saying this was a conversation based on your review of the notes that was the le sort of the left and right boundaries Correct. of what was required with the subpoena. Correct, which is exactly what the kind of conversation you want clients to have with their attorneys and at the end of the conversation an agreement that yes, we're going to do everything the right way. Now, I can see where career prosecutors who have never had the opportunity to actually sit with a client and counsel them can see those questions like, oh my God, he didn't immediately fall down and want to do everything that we demanded him. You know, that, that's evidence of intent to obstruct. But it's not reality. You know, this is why we have the privilege, so that the clients can ask us those questions. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have the discussion and at the end of the discussion, the answer is, okay, well, we're going to do things the right way, 
There's nothing wrong with that. And you're, you're confident the former president did things the right way? Right? Everything I've seen you know, does, does support that, absolutely. When you worked the documents case, was the Pentagon-Iran memo returned to the U.S. government? So this, this memo that's been the subject of this uh, you know, alleged leak tape, I never saw that document. But I will tell you this. All the documents essentially fell into three categories. Those that were returned to the National Archives before the beginning of the investigation, those that were seized by the FBI during the raid, and those that were returned, that were sent to DOJ by our team as part of the various searches. So if that document exists, it would be in one of those three uh, piles, if you will. And when you say you didn't see that document, are you in any way suggesting the document does not exist? I don't know. I, I don't know if it exists because, first of all, we never got a full inventory of what was taken during the raid. And the documents that we returned as part of our various searches, uh, like the first one when Evan went through, he just went through looking for markings. He looked at each page and if he saw a word down at the bottom, confidential, secret. He just took it and threw it in a folder. We weren't allowed to keep copies of them. We weren't allowed to keep records of, you know, inventories of what we had. Uh, on this audio tape, based on our reporting, uh, the former president, the, there's sort of this sound of rustling uh, on the tape. Do you understand that to be this Pentagon-Iran memo, or was he just describing it in that conversation? You know, the tape is not that clear as to what exactly You've listened it to is. the tape. I, I have listened to the tape, and it's not clear to me that he's actually, you know, showing them anything. Uh, it's not clear to me whether he may be just, you know, whether it's a bluff or a joke saying, oh, I have a document right here, and, you know, just waving around a, you know, a stack of white paper. Did you ever ask him if he had that Iran document at that meeting? If I had... That'd be a privileged communication, okay. so I can't discuss Did, it. Just on that point, critics would say that for about a year and a half, there was a back and forth between former President Trump and the National Archives. Yeah. There were subpoenas, and then still more documents were found. That doesn't look like full cooperation to a lot of people. And a lot of that is because of a lack of context. Okay, the, the back and forth between President Trump and the National Archives is not as it's been portrayed, because the reality is... When a president leaves office, there's a whole bunch of documents that are in the White House. Those are ordinarily moved to a narrow facility close to where the president has moved to. So they got, a, they got an old furniture store up in Chicago for President Obama. They got a, a bowling alley in Texas for President Bush. They move all the boxes there, and they allow the president over the next two years to go through these, decide what's personal and what's presidential. When it came to President Trump, the National Archives chose not to do that. And finally, I just want to circle back to something. This, this grand jury in Florida, yeah. you've told us that the grand jury in Washington has expired. That's is, my understanding. Yes. Okay. Is it your expectation that if an indictment is brought against the former president, it is more likely to happen in Florida? I think it would be. I think that Florida has the better venue for this. I, I think that if you bring it in D.C., you're giving a very um, you know, big, juicy motion to dismiss. Why so? Why so? Because nothing, from everything I've seen, there's no allegations of any wrongdoing that's connected to D.C. or that happened in D.C. The government moved all the documents to Mar-a-Lago, not Donald Trump. He was still president when he landed at Mar-a-Lago. And then once he becomes a private citizen, and whatever happened thereafter, if they're, you know, they say that there's willful retention. You know, whatever the evidence shows, they say that there is obstruction. Whatever the evidence shows, all of that happened in Florida. Nothing happened in D.C. And so if you can't make a nexus argument as to any overt act that happened in Washington, D.C., then you don't have a case in Washington, D.C. It would have to be brought in Florida. It would it, have to be brought Based in on the evidence that you've seen. Yes. Okay. Tim Parlatore, thank you very much for speaking with CBS News.